Our next guests are Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss. Uh, they kind of need no introduction, but uh, I'll do it anyway. Um, they are the uh, heads of Gemini, which uh, is a crypto exchange uh, based in New York. Um, sort of a com competitor to to Coinbase. Many of them, many of you guys may know them as uh, my co-founders at Connect U, which was a Facebook predecessor. Um, but you know, I think most. Most importantly, they were they were super early on the Bitcoin train um, and are still on it, uh, uh, really really since day one. So there's a ton to talk about, um, guys. Welcome welcome to the Sum Zero Virtual Summit. Um, you'll want to unmute yourselves. I think you guys are both on mute still. Yep. Hey, dude. Okay, hey, awesome. Dude. There Thanks we go. For us. Great to see you guys. No, great to, great to have you guys on. Um, it's been quite a roller coaster ride. Uh, I think we can all agree to that. Um, really, uh, I think, you know, at the end of 2021, um, when, you know, Jerome Powell decided to start hiking interest rates, um, you know, sort of the start of it. And then you've had, um, you had a war, you've got this war in Ukraine kind of from early 2022. Um, but, you know, 2022 was a really tough year for, um, technology as a sector and, and, and crypto kind of being a subsector of tech. Um, sort of felt that that sort of pain as well. Um, and and now, of course, things have started to stabilize and turn around. Um, so just wanted to get um, your your thoughts on on a on a on a couple of things. Um, first off, uh, I guess most recently, there's been an ETF approval for Bitcoin, probably the biggest news in the sector, you know, and likely responsible for a lot of the the price movement recently that we've seen back you know in the crypto market certainly with Bitcoin specifically, but can you guys just talk about like the significance of that milestone and, and um, you know, what it means for, for both Bitcoin and, and um, you know, some of the, the other uh, digital assets in the space. Sure. Um, <laughs> go for it, Tyler. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah no, no. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're twins. We're literally, saying the same thing at the same time, but um, it's it's really a huge milestone for, for Bitcoin and crypto because it really opens up the floodgates and connects traditional finance to crypto in a way that's never happened before. So we we co-founded Gemini uh, back in 2015 when we launched, or 2014, but we launched in 2015. And you can open up account and hold Bitcoin itself um, but a lot of people can't do that. A lot of investors, a lot of the deepest pockets, they need a securitized wrapper of it. Um, whether you have a foreign K, K or your pension fund, you may not be able to open up an account at Gemini and actually buy Bitcoin itself. Like Just like you may not be able to hold a bar of gold, but you can hold a gold ETF. And so um, it's it's really that, that plumbing between crypto or Bitcoin and traditional finance that is so significant about this milestone. And we, Cameron and I filed for a Bitcoin application back in 2013. So this has been about 10 years in the making. Um, and and it's, it's definitely a, a really significant moment. Yeah. So I think it's, it's about, yes, it's 10 years in the making. Um, and uh, basically... We view like pre ETF Bitcoin is like pre IPO Bitcoin, um, and that's how we were thinking about it. And now all of a sudden you sort of have this IPO of sorts and this connection to traditional finance. And the people who are going to be buying these ETFs or who have started to buy them are likely people who cannot go direct to an exchange. They need to do it through, as Tyler mentioned, a security wrapper like an ETF. And so they're doing it through a retirement account or their, their account at BlackRock. Um, and so this is bringing new money into, into crypto and, and very large money. And it's going to just keep accumulating because as, as I think we all know, people buy uh, ETFs, they don't generally sell them. So it's basically just going to be a accumulation and hodl from here on out. And the inflows, I think it's been... A couple of weeks, the inflows, uh, I think BlackRock crossed about $3 billion already, which is a huge success for, for an early ETF. I think it's breaking, broken 
a lot of records. And there's a number of other people who have accumulated, I think Fidelity has accumulated over a billion. And then there's ARK and a couple other players like Van Eck who have um, accumulated hundreds of millions. But the inflows are really interesting because more is coming into these ETFs than Bitcoin is being mined. So every 10 minutes, there's a block reward and the winner, the miner gets newly minted Bitcoin. And these inflows are are now outpacing the block reward, the newly minted Bitcoin uh, um, every day. And so I think that's a tremendous catalyst um, leading into the happening where the block reward will cut in half again. Um, that's the, how the supply um, cycle of Bitcoin works. Every four years, the amount of newly minted Bitcoin per 10 minutes uh, is cut in half. So we have this really large catalyst that is now basically um, taking more Bitcoin off the market than is being created on a daily basis. And then the amount that's being created will cut in half around, I think, sometime in April um, or May. Um, and so the, we've never gone into a halvening. Like historically, halvenings have been huge pri price catalysts because it just reduces the supply being minted um, every 10 minutes. We've never had ETF flows um, that that are basically purchasing more than, than it's being minted. So I think this could be a very interesting, I, I think it's going to be a super cycle um, as we pass through the happening. And so this is, um, I think, very bullish. There is, um, there's basically a run up to $50,000 Bitcoin um, with anticipation of the, the approvals. There was a fade down to about 40 because uh, I think uh, about six billion dollars left the grayscale ETF. Um, they have higher fees, and there's people stuck in that product that could not redeem. They've since redeemed. That sort of worked its way through the market, and now we're back at to 45 because I think that just the simple um, like reality is, is is that people are buying more than it's being created. In Bitcoin, I think you know we we liken it to digital gold. Um, if you look at the properties, Bitcoin really has the properties of an emergent store of value. And there's no commodity in the universe where the supply does not expand with demand. Even gold, as demand increases, then people will go mine for mo more gold. They'll, they'll build better technology and, and, or it'll make sense to you know, look for gold in certain areas that otherwise wouldn't be viable at, at certain price points. As the Bitcoin price goes up, there's no expansion in the supply. It is truly fixed at 21 million Bitcoin. And I think it, it actually takes people a while to wrap their head around it. But I think once you see that the supply is not expanding, the inflows now are, are overtaking the amount being minted on a daily basis. Um, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting 24 to 36 months ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Do you do you think that yeah. supply yeah. demand imbalance is sustainable? I do because if you so a number of the large ETF, uh, a number of the large asset managers haven't turned ETFs on yet in their platform. Uh, I think there's usually. Um, they require like a couple of months to sort of make sure everything gets ironed out. They do their diligence. So I think uh, while BlackRock, for example, has Bitcoin in their models and people who are on that platform can allocate to Bitcoin now um, or people who are you know, at Fidelity, for example, there's still a number of large players who are not offering to the customers yet. So we're really just at the beginning. We're, we're weeks into it. And some of the biggest um, uh, like hoses, so to speak, haven't turned on. So I do think that the accumulation in these ETFs is 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 only going to ramp up a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one one metaphor I I like to use a little bit about the Bitcoin ETFs. It's sort of like if you were in uh, consumer packaged goods, if you had a good and you got into Walmart. Um, that's a really big deal. That can that can kind of make your business. If you get onto an end cap or you get up close to the real estate near the register, uh, it, it usually can make a company. And and I think that the um, 
right now to sort of extend that metaphor um, is that you're not in every Walmart yet. Uh, maybe you're in 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 ten or a hundred. Uh, it, it's just a distribution uh, th- solution, um, and so uh, like in, in many ways, Bitcoin is now like on the platform, or it's starting to be. And for asset allocators, it's becoming um, you know a toggle switch, and that's a pretty that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, one one anecdote. That, or this is kind of an interesting data point. We were looking at um, uh, potentially investing in Bitcoin, um, but the bank that we were talking to said that if we wanted to do that, we'd have to hold like, it was like some crazy amount in reserves. Um, right. Which sort of made it uneconomic to own the Bitcoin at all. <clears throat> and this circumvents that problem entirely. So it, it, it's just... It's a huge bottleneck that's been removed. Um, Cameron, you mentioned, um, you know, there's there's a lot of demand that that isn't that hasn't quite turned on yet because it sounds like certain um, maybe financial advisory shops or similar institutions like need a certain grace period before they can actually buy these ETFs. Can, can you um, dive into that a little bit further? I mean, are there certain institutions that you know of that um, like you know, have demand for it, but are just waiting in the wings um, that you can speak to. Or uh, I'm just curious what the the sort yeah, of how that would I don't, play out. I don't know specifics, but what, what I've heard, I, I think uh, places like Wells Fargo. I'm not sure if J.P. Morgan has any ETFs on their platform or Morgan Stanley. Um, like so the private banks. Yeah, there's some. I th- I still think there's. A, a lot of large private banks um, and platforms that that haven't put them on yet, and part of it, it's it's just you know I think their their policy is that they just don't put things on unless they've had a certain you know time in the market, so to speak. And then there's um, uh, there will be one or two platforms uh, that probably won't do it. Um, it will take like a, a year or two, or they're just not you know they're against Bitcoin for whatever reason. But I do think that we're going to see like the the ETF um, folks that I've spoken with say that usually there's about two to three months lag between launch of new product and then getting getting the the ETFs onto their platforms. There's some who are obviously there, like Fidelity's there, BlackRock's there, um, and I'm sure there's a few others. But we are seeing just the beginning of of uh, Bitcoin being platformed, so to speak. So now what is the, now that this sort of hurdle has been crossed, like what, what is the, maybe, what do you think is the time frame before like there's an Ethereum ETF or ETFs for other digital assets? Do you think it's years out or months out or? Uh, in theory, it should be, I think Ethereum should be months out because it's a, it's a commodity. And so once you, I mean, if you, if you create a rule set for, for basically digital assets that are commodities. And and I think anything that fits within that framework should be viable for an ETF. Of course, the SEC, I'm I'm sure can come up with reasons why they can try and delay, but I do think that Ethereum is is more of a uh, when, not an if. Um, So do we see that in 2024? I I think likely the bellwether usually is Who's filed applications? And I, I think BlackRock's already filed one, and and a lot of the big players have already filed them. So they 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 likely feel confident that um, they can run the similar playbook to Bitcoin um, with Ethereum. So I, I think it's going to be it's definitely not going to be ten years like Bitcoin. I think it'll right, probably right. be within the next uh, twelve months or so. And and I think there's an important distinction to be made. Whereas uh, the SEC, I believe, does not consider Ether, which is the coin of the Ethereum network, a security. So they mm-hmm. they group it as a commodity like Bitcoin. So I think that given the fact that they greenlit a Bitcoin ETF and they consider Bitcoin a commodity and Ether a commodity, Ether could be a fast follower. It could happen sometime this year. I think I read a headline or some report where someone said or predicted um, that it would happen uh, in 2024, the question is um, the an ETF for for a 
a cryptocurrency that the SEC does not deem to be a commodity, like let's say Ripple. Um, you know, I think that that could be a longer story. Um, but Ether, Ether, I, I'm, I'm, I would be pretty bullish that we could see an ETF for that sooner rather than later. Um, the question is that when you get outside, when you step outside of Bitcoin and Ether, um, what would the timeline be for for Zcash, um, for for Ripple? And Zcash is a fork of Bitcoin, so there may be a better argument um, that it is a commodity um, or an easier argument. Um, so we'll sort of see how that all plays out. And obviously, a new commission could take a different posture towards towards some of these other cryptos outside of Bitcoin and Ether. Certainly, the courts are. Yeah. They're saying that right. the crypt not all cryptos are securities, and the SEC is losing a lot of those battles that the, the Ripple case um, and whatnot. And and my prediction is that they will continue to lose these battles where they try and square peg into a round hole cryptos into securities frameworks that is now almost 80 years old. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, so one of the things that I, I mean, I noticed, um, and maybe this is sort of like to be expected, but there's been a huge amount of dispersion now between Bitcoin, Ethereum, and like kind of everything else. And, um, you know, so on the way down, like, you know, as hard as it was for, I think, Bitcoin and Ethereum holders to, to like, let's say, own Bitcoin at 50 and watch it drop to 20, um, it was far worse for a lot of the altcoin holders that own stuff that maybe fell, you know, 95% or, or more. Um, do, do you kind of see this market um, as as kind of at some point developing beyond the, two, the, the, the top two coins? I mean, do you see like in, in the altcoin, you know, kind of downstream of the, the, the big names, like any any particular tokens that have like, you know, real viability in terms of being mm -hmm. liquid, you know, sustainable tokens that aren't just like fads or, you know, relics of the past, like which of these are going to have any kind of real staying power? Yeah. So that's a great question. I mean, I think the short answer is yes, there will definitely be viable projects beyond Bitcoin and Ethereum, but there's going to be a lot of pets.com and projects that fail um, or, or never really find that that traction or killer use case. I think I think it's important to note like Bitcoin has found its killer use case, it's digital gold and, and it's an inflation hedge, it's a disaster hedge. Um, it's truly, you know, a fixed store of value. And we wrote a thought piece um, a couple of years back where we said, you know, if it, our belief is Bitcoin overtakes gold. Um, it's just a matter of time and it, it will likely do that within the next five to 10 years. And if you look at the gold market cap, the math's pretty easy. I think it's around 10 trillion. Um, Bitcoin, you know, it, it, I think will go up about 20, 25 times from where it is today to, to overtake gold. And it's just a, it's a matter of time. Um, and, and that's really all Bitcoin needs to do is really just be a better gold, which it, it is if you look at the properties, it's it's more portable, it's more divisible. Um, you can't counterfeit it. It's um, it just sort of beats gold across the board. Um, and if you talk to any millennial like um, or Gen Z, they want you know they don't want to own hardware. They want to own software. They live online. They they grew up in a streaming world, um, and that's where they that's where they are. Ethereum is basically a decentralized virtual computer. So think of like the, this decentralized operating system where you can build um, decentralized apps on top of it. And it's already found tremendous market fit with decentralized finance, DeFi. Um, there's decentralized exchanges, lending protocols, um, all kinds of different um, financial uh things being built on top of Ethereum. And it's basically re-architecting the traditional financial system in a permissionless, trustless way. And I think, you know, how, how do you put a, a value on um, what will be the largest operating system in, in, on, in the world? I mean, if you add like iOS, Mac OS, uh, Android, 
Linux, the major operating systems together, Microsoft, Windows, like the Ethereum is that um, for, for builders. And, you know, will there be, is, is there room for maybe one or two others? Possibly, because there are, you know, two to three major operating systems. I think people like variety and there's trade-offs um, depending on how you, how you build it. But there's not room for more than a, a few. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think that there's uh, like Filecoin is an interesting project, decentralized file storage. Uh, and there will be like, a, I think, a, a lot of other utility tokens. Um, and then, of course, there's stable coins. If you look at Tether, it's, I think, got something like $80, $90 billion in, in stable coins. And I think their numbers, I think they made more last quarter in profit than Goldman Sachs. Um, and so there's like a need, <laughs> there's a need for, um, you know, being able to send money or tokenize money. And, and by the way, how did, how did they, what was the source of that income? Like what, what's the business model there for the, the company? Sure. It's, it's just interest on, on the, uh, the underlying treasuries and assets that they hold. The, the dollars that back Tether are put into T-bills. Yeah. And, um, and so that interest uh, is in the billions of dollars. And so, but there's this huge need. And People want money to move like email 24 seven. Yeah. Who I mean, owns that stream? Who owns the stream, the, the like revenue? It, yeah, yeah, I don't like, know the specifics. There, is, it, is it, there, uh, is there's it a like, company and creator behind it. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're, they're doing quite well. But um, another way to sort of think about it is Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're layer one tokens. Um, and I think the power law will hold true there. But there's also things called layer two tokens that are built on top of Ethereum. So there's like a breath um, but there's also a depth or a height to the stack. So there's like L1s, there's L2s, there's bridges. Um, a lot of like the future might be interoperability between these chains. Um, but there's 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 probably room for a few because there's a trade-off between decentralization and throughput and speed. The more centralized you are, the more throughput um, and low latency you can be but then you give up decentralization. And so it's 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 this spectrum and there's probably room for experimentation for a couple. Bitcoin's, yeah. Bitcoin's like the ultimately ultimate decentralized end of the spectrum. And then you have Ethereum, you have Solana and there's gonna be other experimentations. So there's probably, it's probably gonna look a little bit like fiat currencies. There's a, a couple big ones, there's three to five big ones and the rest are kind of, you know, not, not that, interesting or there's not that much liquidity or trading with them and so i think there's going to be you're going to see the power law you know with 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 l1s but also with with l2s and really like the they're going to rise and fall on the use case and the value they can present to the users um i don't know if it's too early to, to talk about the questions that have been asked but um you know i think i think another point that hits on a few of them is this idea of network effects and how powerful they are. Like, why can't we just, all of us can go just fork Bitcoin right now and create Bitcoin some zero. But we have to get the miners, the users, the entire network to come over and use it and adopt it. And network effects are really powerful. Um, that's why it's been so hard for Google to break into social and go after Facebook. Or that's why it's been very hard for Facebook meta to go after Twitter. Network effects are so strong. And if you're good enough and you're first, you're usually the winner and it's a winner and it's a winner uh, take all. So you can, you, you know, they, they can throw all these resources at it, but, but the users actually don't want it. I don't want to post my pictures 10 different times, open up 10 different apps. So I'll fight against it for the companies. Like I want to tweet one time to everyone, you know, one to many. I don't want to have to go to Twitter and 10 other platforms. And I think that, that that the network effects and when you when you think about crypto and how to value it, it's important to think that these are networks and to think about value them, it's not with a cash flow model, it's with Metcalf's law and the number of users, uh, you know, exponentially squared. 
And so I think that that's the paradigm that we, that, that at least we view this as. Obviously, we, we compare Bitcoin to gold and the money characteristics. And you look at the market cap of, 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 of Bitcoin um, versus gold. And if it's gold 2.0, if it's gold that works like email, then it's going to disrupt the 10 trillion market cap of gold or whatever it is today. And Cam and I, we actually wrote a thought piece a few years ago and said, okay, the back of the envelope math is that each Bitcoin will be worth at least 500K if Bitcoin disrupts gold, but Bitcoin's more than gold because it's this network, it's digital. And we can kind of go into that's, you know, we can go endlessly into that, but um, yeah. that's how we think about this. Has, has your mix shifted at all in, in terms of your personal exposure to crypto? I mean, when you started out, I mean, you were like 100% Bitcoin. Have you seen developments of late that have made you pull some money out of Bitcoin into Ethereum or some of the other projects out there? And, you know, at a high level, what, what, what would you say is your overall allocation right now if we were to put it into like three categories, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then like other? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, we started with Bitcoin because that's all there was initially. We were 100% Bitcoin. And then when yeah. Ethereum came out, um, we went and and purchased a lot of Ethereum. And then um, I, I always view those as like the blue chips. They 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 feel like the, um, I mean, Bitcoins, they're obviously the, the two oldest. They've also gotten tremendous uh, traction. They have huge developer communities. People often say, hey, what, what backs... Bitcoin, I don't get it. Well, you know, the U.S. government's backed by the the might of the U.S. military. Well, Bitcoin is backed by the largest computer mining network um, on the planet, and uh, and Ethereum has a tremendous mining community as well. So um, the but beyond that, I mean, Zcash is interesting. It has privacy features. Uh, a lot of people would argue that Bitcoin's too open. Uh, Filecoin, we were early investors in Filecoin. It's trying to create a decentralized storage network. Um, but I think that if you're looking to cover most of your bases, I mean, a lot of people love to go out on the horizon and look at all these different projects, which is awesome if you have the time and interest. But I think you have a tremendous amount of your bases covered with Bitcoin and Ether. With ETFs now online, um, I think you you probably want to be you know pretty heavily weighted uh, Bitcoin, but I think Ethereum, I mean, I'm not sure what the, what the right breakdown is. It's 60, 40, 70, 30. Um, I think Ethereum ETFs are also pretty, pretty close on the horizon, but with those two, as Tyler was talking earlier, there's a lot of tokens and layer twos built on top of Ethereum. And a lot of that value, um, accrues to the underlying network. So by owning Ethereum, you do have, you are sort of indexing the projects built on top to some extent. And getting some of that value. Solana is an Ethereum alternative. There's a lot of tokens being built on top of that as well. You can buy Solana and index a lot of that value with that with, with Solana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would yeah. think about it a little bit in terms of um, what's your return risk appetite. So, you know, Bitcoin. It's easy to see a 10x from here from my point of view. Uh, maybe even much higher. Um, maybe it becomes the the crypto global reserve currency. It unseats the dollar, so the sky's the limit, and people keep keep building on top of it. But um, you know, if you really want those crazy one thousand x venture returns, then you probably have to go out, you know, more into the alt coin um, universe. So, um, but but yeah, I think I think I would always start with Bitcoin. It's easy to understand. It's the oldest. It's blue chip. Bitcoin and Ethereum, like Cameron said, you know, digital gold, digital compute, um, you know, get familiar there. And then you can always venture out, um, you know, broader. Can we step back to your comment about, can we step back um, to your comment about uh, the potential for becoming a, a global reserve currency? Like what would be the steps that you think you know, we need to, it would need to cross to, to get there. Mm -hmm. Is that, is yeah. that, is that the bull? That's kind of your, your sky. That's the like the super, that's, what, the, that's the base of that is. That's like the, the super bull case. Um, it becomes the reserve currency. So what would it take to get there? Well, if we look at the, the current um, debt situation in the U S it's just completely unsustainable. 
as I think everybody on this call would agree with and knows, uh, the interest payments alone are just staggering. And it seems like nobody has an appetite to rein it in, um, which is beyond irresponsible and disappointing. At some point, it's just going to defy credibility and people are going to, you know, not believe in the creditworthiness of the U.S. and the, and the dollar and the, 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 the money printing and the overspending. So if that continues at its current pace, there will be some point in the future. But I think also a lot of countries are um, trying to create, you know, break off from U.S. dollar trade settlement. I think there's the BRICS consortium and, and a couple others. You know, and, and people are trying to basically wean themselves off the U.S. dollar. The problem is that um, most of the people in the U.S. government at the top position still think that it's 1950, and you know we're post Marshall Plan, and 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 the you know all all basically in international trade is is settled with the U.S. dollar, and that just will continue because it will continue. And I don't think they really understand that that's not like a, a given necessarily, and that there's tremendous motivation for a lot of countries to basically um, not settle in the dollar. And while that still might be small percentage wise, th there's still, it feels like it's moving in that direction. And um, if, if I think if the US dollar and the, and the US government doesn't get their act together, I think you're going to see more and more countries like El Salvador being one of the first adopting Bitcoin as as legal tender um, and or, or just failed countries. Um, uh, and, and also, we know, might talk about what these countries hold on their balance sheet. Right. Maybe traditionally they said dollars is safe, but with inflation and money printing and whatnot and the soft defaulting of the dollar, maybe they start to say, let's put Bitcoin on our balance sheet. We've already seen that in a couple of countries. I believe El Salvador has has done that. Um, Argentina seems like a prime candidate, especially with their new president, Javier Mille. Um, and so um, when countries start to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, their central banks start holding it and then starting to settle trade with Bitcoin, then um, you can see a path towards um, unseating the dollar. And like Cameron mentioned, the only person who likes the dollar as a global reserve currency is the U.S. because it gives us this unfair advantage. Um, and so a lot of countries don't like that, right? And, and the power that we can wield with it, whether it's economic sanctions or um, the cost of capital is so low for us to borrow. Um, but ultimately, there are plenty of countries out there that, that would prefer no one to have it, especially not us. Um, and, and Bitcoin could be that Switzerland in, in a way um, that could become the, the global reserve currency. So um, that, that could be a huge, huge moment. We can't, we can't rule out that possibility. Yeah, that, that's super interesting thinking about it from the standpoint of countries outside the U.S. Um, can you guys just rate uh, uh, Gary Gensler's performance? Um, so far, just curious to get your thoughts on, on, you know, kind of his effort, like just his, 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 his sort of emblematic of, I think, of a lot of the challenges that the industry faces, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts on him. <clears throat> yeah. So what's the scale of rating? <laughs> Zero to 10? One to 10. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like negative. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. so the, yeah. where do we start? Um, I think the SEC has provided, has not written a single rule or guidance for, for crypto. And they've totally talked out of both sides of the mouth. So he's been in front of Congress saying, I don't have the, the mandate to regulate crypto. And then six months later, a year later, he says, uh, just kidding. Every crypto is a security. Now you've got to comply with security laws, which makes no sense because if you go to, and it says, you know, go to this forum online and whatnot. But if you look at the forums, you know, who is the CEO? Who is the board of directors? Well, Bitcoin doesn't have a CEO. It doesn't have a board of directors. So it's a hollow gesture. It's a disingenuous gesture that this idea that 
that Ethereum can just walk in. Who is Ethereum? It's not one person. It's not a company. It's not a CEO. There's no board of directors. It's not a C-Corp can walk in and register. And so it's, um, and they've used that excuse saying, oh, you haven't registered, which is an impossible thing to do. And because you haven't registered, um, we'll just sue you. And so there, it's been a regulation through enforcement uh, posture. And, and it really hasn't been constructive because mm -hmm. nobody knows what to do. You can't come in and register and and there's no guidance there's no rulemaking and their position is that everything is a security which which makes no sense if securities can't be traded peer to peer like i can't send you a security from my phone to your phone and so that completely defeats and kills the purpose of crypto and so um there's been a real failure to understand that this is something very different this is a new paradigm and we need we need cooperation between regulators to help understand this and work with industry. And there's been no real collaboration. It's been you know a very much a, a hollow gesture. Um, and so and just stepping back, it's it's really been all political, and we can kind of get into that. But um, it's been it's been pretty bad uh, for mm -hmm. for the crypto industry. They haven't stopped any of the frauds. They didn't catch FTX. They didn't catch, you know, Terra Luna, any of the blowups. They didn't prevent it, and their response was just to turn around and start suing all the good actors. And maybe stepping back, just again, and we could spend, you know, hours talking about this. Um, and certainly, we've we've lived it. But the failure to greenlight a Bitcoin ETF created all of the problems and all of the frauds that we saw in 2022 and 2023. Because what it did is it pushed everyone offshore into the arms of players like FTX and whatnot, instead of it happening here. And so because the regulation was too draconian, it was, too, it was walls and you couldn't get anything done companies left the U.S. And U.S. investors left the U.S. because they saw the opportunity over there. They couldn't get it here. And so I think it set the stage for, for all this bad behavior, ultimately. I think if, if, the, if, the, if the Bitcoin ETF had been greenlit in 2018, I don't think you would have had FTX. I don't think you would have had a lot of these frauds. And U.S. Invest, US investors would have stayed on... Uh, more regulated platforms because they could have gotten the opportunity, the coins, the products they wanted, as opposed to having to go offshore. It was a complete wild west. So I think history will not be kind in the look back to the SEC. I think ultimately it will come down that the last decade, uh, they were a failed regulator when it came to crypto and understanding the future and being agile and working with companies to 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 usher in uh, that future, and what did they protect U.S. investors from at the end of the day by not greenlighting a Bitcoin ETF five seven years ago? They protected them from Bitcoin, which was the best performing asset of the last decade, and is showing to be the best performing act uh, asset of of this decade. It's like preventing U.S. investors from you know a fan company from Tesla or or whatnot um, in, in, in uh, Facebook. And so I, I, I'm not, as you can see, we, we do not, we're not um, view, view their, um, view the SEC favorably, their track record. Yeah, I mean, ago. Tyler, you, you said it, you covered a lot of ground there, but um, I think that it's very clear, like the SEC is not a regulator of the future. They're they're clinging on to eighty year old laws um, and and really refusing to update anything or get with the times. And I think that that is just you know they're they're really the, the brand has been I think really damaged, um, and it's proven to be an incredibly political organization. You know the the mandate is capital formation and investor protection. 
And that's that's that was my you know impression of the SEC when we filed our first Bitcoin ETF in 2013. Like this is a rigorous institution. They're they're being thoughtful about how to usher in new products and think through it. Um, but what they've really proven is that it's just um, hyper political. And they didn't approve Bitcoin ETFs because they wanted to. They did it begrudgingly because they had to because they lost the grayscale court case. Um, so even the ETF, they still don't really want to greenlight them. And uh, there's so many bizarre inconsistencies with their approach. For example, they let Coinbase become a publicly traded company. And then they sued them and said, hey, everything you're doing falls under our mandate and you're you're operating illegally. Well, two years why did later. You, yeah. Why did you approve the rest one two years prior and allow them to go public if you had such an issue with how they're operating? And so I joke that, you know, being being sued by the SEC used to mean you did, you probably did something wrong. Today, being sued by the SEC probably means you're doing something right. It means you're being innovative and you're trying to build product, new products and services and new, you know, financial tools and access in the U.S. And you know, the, the the track record is is really abysmal. As Tyler mentioned, they haven't prevented any blow up. They just show up to the scene after the crime, and say, "Oh, you're you're all guilty. You're in crypto. You're all guilty." Um, by association, they haven't actually prevented anything. So we have to ask ourselves, like, as more and more regulations get added, like by the day, which makes it harder to build, harder to innovate, and harder to do business. At what point, you know, is there a reset where you say this is just this is this is this is totally killing innovation? These institutions either have to modernize or be gutted and redone um, because the, the the track record is just abysmal. Anyway, we could go on for a long time on this topic. Yeah. 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 No, I was going to ask. I mean, related to that. What does the was what does the upcoming presidential election mean for you guys in terms of how it could affect the industry from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, that's a that's a good that that is a very important question. Um, I think that the hostility of the current administration and the SEC um, and, and the leaders at various institutions against crypto. Um, is is really um, if that switches, that's going to be a huge you know benefit, obviously. And so I think like we have to continue to remember that like ETFs weren't approved because the SEC believes in the product; they had to. The SEC has been attacking um, regulated businesses like Gemini, like Coinbase, who have always operated within the spirit of the law, and it's just pure political regulatory attack. Um, by Gary Gensler to appease um, Elizabeth Warren because he he wants you know a political appointment down the road right he made a pact with the progressives to you know I'm going to be I'm going to lead the war on crypto and uh, it, it's very kind of obvious and transparent what's going right. on he, he, he's he's become their attack dog right he is he, Elizabeth Warren's pit bull right so. Um, so in spite of all that, because because being the chair of the SEC is a stepping stone for him to another higher political office, which people speculate is to become the secretary of the treasury. That's so, really what we're talking about here. When, when you talk about U.S. investors, innovation, the economy, we're talking about his own political, personal agenda and ambitions. So when you when you look at forty five thousand dollar Bitcoin today. And the SEC has brought all of the resources and might to try and sue and slow it down and stop it. And by the way, they, they're losing. They lost Ripple. They lost Grayscale. They continue to lose across the board because they, they've they been picking these fights and they're on the wrong side of the law and they refuse to pass regulation. And so I actually think the, the SEC's mandate uh, long term is going to be greatly diminished because of the refusal to actually build, like the judges are just gonna, they're just um, making the law for them. But the point, my, my, my larger point here is that Bitcoin is at 45,000 with tremendous regulatory headwind in the US. And it's not sustainable, like the, the headwinds are 
um, you know, Bitcoin will far outlast one person's political uh, ambitions. It's it's way greater than that. Um, but it, you know, I think if we see a switch to a Republican um, president, I think you're going to see a much different landscape, a much more innovation friendly. I think we're going to see a lot of um, repeal or cut back of the regulatory state. And I think that um, we we really need, America needs a reset on this. Um, it's just, it's impossible to do business and build at the speed of innovation at this point. And the internet would have absolutely been killed by regulation if the lawmakers and regulators understood how big it was going to be back in the 90s during the, the, the early days of the commercial internet. They would have absolutely killed the internet, um, but they took a light touch approach and it was the right approach and we see what's happened. And the regulators today are trying to kill crypto and they're doing their best to do it, but they, they actually can't. That's the beauty of crypto. Like the internet, you could have potentially really um, tried to limit it, but with crypto, they, they actually can't. So they're aware of how big it is and how powerful it is and how it disrupts power structures and how it's going to level the playing field. And, and, and when you see Jamie Dimon um, you know, attacking Bitcoin in response to a question with Elizabeth Warren, it's, it's very clear like, what the power structure wants and what they're, what they're afraid of, right? They don't like um, access, universal access. They don't like the ability to bank yourself with a smartphone and a Bitcoin address. They don't like all the promise, um, despite what they say, that crypto ushers in. But the good news is, is that it's way more, it, it, it can't be stopped. And so they understand the power, but it, it can't be stopped. Yeah, I'd like to say that um, crypto's made the right enemies. <laughs> that's really uh, that's it's quite an interesting thought. That's that's fascinating. It's almost kind of like what could have been. Um, guys, we have a couple questions uh, from listeners. Um, I think Braden's kind of got them at, at his disposal. Braden, you want to just um, relay those over? <clears throat> we'll start with uh, the one about 21 million Bitcoins being reached. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, one of these questions came through a bit earlier. So just talking about limited supply um, being at 21 million. So if 21 million is reached and there are no more coins to mine to validate the network, what happens in that end state? Yeah, that's a so, great question. Um, so miners make... Uh, they earn Bitcoin in two ways. They get the reward, the mining reward every 10 minutes. And like Cameron mentioned earlier, that award is going to be cut in half in, in um, around April or May of this year. So that supply being dumped on the market will be much less. It's currently uh, 6.25 Bitcoins every, every 10 minutes. And that will be cut down to uh, 3.125 uh, I believe on, I think around the 21st of April. Right. So when the miners earn Bitcoin, oftentimes they have to sell it to reinvest in more uh, mining rigs and keep ahead the pace of, of innovation. It's sort of a arms race, the mining arms race. So the sell pressure on the market, when the Bitcoin having, having happens, um, the sell pressure will, will uh, cut in half. Um, which is always, again, usually a, a good catalyst for for Bitcoin. Some people argue that it's priced in, um, but it never it always seems to be a catalyst of sorts, um, a big sort of inflection point. Um, the other way that miners earn earn Bitcoin is uh, transaction fees. So to send Bitcoin, um, you have to pay a transaction fee, um, and ultimately, um, so that that balance of mining reward uh, and transaction fees will pretty much shift entirely to uh, miners earning transaction fees when the 21 million uh, cap is 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 reached. Um, so it will turn into more of a for for validating the network and being the network for free, they will just just be charging transaction fees uh, whereas today they earn, the mining reward every 10 minutes, but also charge some transaction fees. 
And just to time scale that, it's uh, I think by 2140 is when all bitcoins will be are expected to be in in circulation. So um, about 120 years from now. And just to put some numbers on it, so at six six and a quarter Bitcoin per ten minutes, roughly three hundred thousand dollars of value is created every ten minutes in the Bitcoin network. That's going to cut in half. So assuming the same prices as today in April, that's going to go down to about one hundred and fifty thousand. Um, so that the 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 amount of Bitcoin being created cuts in half. Assuming miners are selling a, a good portion of that to fund further operations that reduces selling pressure. And then as discussed earlier, ETFs are already accumulating more Bitcoin per day um, in aggregate than new Bitcoin are being created. That, that um, That's new as of weeks ago. That buying uh, sort of pressure has never existed in that form. And as I mentioned, it's just getting started um, we've never gone into a happening with that type of buy pressure, that buy and hold pressure from ETFs. And while you know the efficient market hypothesis would tell you it's all priced in, it historically never has been. Um, and I think a lot of that, you know, is is new entrants understanding like, oh, this is truly fixed. I get it. And then it just there builds this huge demand um, and awareness into these cycles. Got it. Here's an interesting one. Um, talking about Bitcoin versus dollar. So uh, as we as Americans, are we undermining our own future by endorsing Bitcoin instead of upholding the dominance of the U.S. dollar? Additionally, is it not the responsibility of branches of our gov government, Department of the DOD, the Fed, to safeguard the dollar's position? Yeah, that's a really, really fun question. Um, so in, I always view Bitcoin as an alternative to holding fiat dollars. And if you look at gold since the 70s, I think it's up about 26 times. US dollars lost about 95 plus percent of value since the 70s. So having giving people an, op an an option to store value in something outside of the US dollar or even real estate which leaks value um over time and is you know through property taxes, maintenance, depreciation, all that um it's very important to give people alternatives like hard money. And Bitcoin is just another alternative that we believe is superior to gold and, and meets the the needs and desires of people um, of today. And, and so we, we don't really view Bitcoin like it, what it does, I think, at least in the short to medium term, is it's a counterbalance and it, it keeps people honest. And if you don't like what's going on with the US dollar, and you don't want to invest in the, the government, or you don't support how they're spending the money uh, like a drunken sailor, you put your money into gold or Bitcoin. And it's it's in, in, in many ways, I think, a protest of sorts. You vote with your wallet and you say, you know what, I don't believe in this system anymore. It's not serving me. This money um, may have worked for, for boomers and they may believe in that in that type of money, that fiction, but that's not my story. I want to go over to Bitcoin. And when you give people alternatives, it creates, I think, better behavior. I think at some point, the 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 U.S. will say, "Wait, we can't just keep uh, adding trillions of dollars of debt. Um, we're losing our ability, you know, for for many things." And so, I think it keeps the government more honest. I think it keeps um, it, and it, I think people are at their best when they have options and choice. And, you know, when countries employ capital controls, it's always a sign of weakness, right? It's never, never a good thing. Um, if the US though continues down its path, they're going to lose um, sort of being the reserve currency. And, and I think that like, while that may hurt the government on some level, A, we're not there and maybe we don't get there, but B, um, I don't know, like it, 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 maybe that's just where it's where it's going to go anyway. And it's going to create like 
um, a, a Switzerland of sorts and and potentially um, a better better long term situation. I th- think the best <clears throat> the best um, way to protect the the dollar is responsible fiscal management. Attacking Bitcoin won't change anything, and um, you can't stop Bitcoin, right? It, there's no there's no choke point. There's no CEO. There's no company. Um, it's it's a protocol, and it lives wherever the internet lives. And so to to stop Bitcoin, you have to stop the internet effectively. So, um, and people right now, they aren't really spending Bitcoin because it's an appreciating asset. It's sound, hard money like gold. And so I don't think it's really um, competing with the dollar at the end of the day. Um, so so that's kind of like our, our position is, is like, you, you can't stop this. That's why it's so powerful. So you should work with it. And if you want to protect the dollar, then make the dollar attractive for people to hold and to use and to spend. Guys, that was super interesting. Um, I, I think we can we can pretty much end it on that note. A um, lot to unpack here. Um, yeah, it's uh, the the sort of geopolitical implications of fiscal spending are, are quite real. Um, and I guess you know the question around when the U.S. will actually rein in the spending is is. Uh, um sort of a big unknown people have been talking about this for the last four decades probably you know what's going on with the u.s debt um but when, I mean, when it, will it come it to true, a head i don't know is it true divya that we we've, we've uh we've run a deficit something like 46 out of the last 50 years something crazy so the question is like can we stop this inertia yeah, well, unfortunately, there are a lot of folks in government who believe in modern monetary theory um, and a lot of other bogus economic frameworks that, um, you know, really do nothing but harm. And we've, we've seen that recently with inflation. I mean, uh, you know, I think for anyone who's been to a, you know, a, a gas pump recently or, is, you know, watch their their own personal P&L recently, it's, it's probably going up um, or has gone up. And generally things don't come down once they go up as far as, you know, consumer goods and services go. So. Um, yeah, I, anyway, um, a ton to unpack. I think, I think the regulatory aspect of where we are as a country is, um, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, but you know, the, your comments have been super, super interesting. So guys, thanks again for, for sharing the insights. Um, we'll, uh, certainly be, you know, keep tracking the asset class and, and, um, hopefully we can, we can have this conversation again after the election. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks very much for having us. Good chatting, Divya. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Take care, guys.